Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Welcome to Wellness Evolution, a podcast with inspiring and thoughtful conversations highlighting the connection between health and wellness. Whether it's through finding the right treatment or making lifestyle changes, we hope these stories provide relatable topics and perhaps personal inspiration. So join me in exploring the many paths to wellness through the lens of a diverse group of people as we cover topics such as chronic illness, mental health, spirituality, and everything in between. Hello, my name is Angel Tapia, and I'm the Senior Manager of Hispanic Outreach at Global Healthy Living Foundation. Today, we have a special episode where I'm joined by Ashley Krivalovic. She is an Oklahoman native and a proud member of the Cherokee Nation. She was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis, and following her diagnosis, Ashley began doing advocacy work. Ashley has been featured in WebMD, Women'sHealth.com, Reader's Digest, and more. She sits on GHLF's Patient Board for Patient Spot and co-chairs the Central Region Advocacy Board for the National Psoriasis Foundation. Also, in 2023, the National Psoriasis Foundation named her Advocate of the Year. Ashley, there are so many wonderful things that I can share about you. So thank you for accepting this invitation and welcome to Wellness Evolution. Oh, thank you so much, Angel. I'm so excited to be here. So I'm going to quote you for a minute. You said, knowing that there is emotional support disease education, and treatment options is essential to having disease control. My goal through my advocacy work is to give each person the tools they need following a diagnosis. I thought those were very powerful words. So can you share some insights into some of the unique health challenges that Indigenous communities face and how these challenges differ from the mainstream healthcare issues? Yeah, I think the very first one is just access to care. You know, if you're on a reservation, your nearest clinic may be two hours away. And so just getting access to care is a big deal. And that's just for your run-of-the-mill colds and sinus infections and blood pressure checks and stuff like that. If you need a specialist, it's even harder to get that help. So number one is, and always probably will be access to care geographically and otherwise. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing just those details that I think puts things into perspective for some of the differences that our Indigenous community members face. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the cultural stigma that can sometimes deter individuals from seeking health care. What are your suggestions on how we can address that cultural stigma within the Indigenous community and promote a more open dialogue about health concerns? Well, I think the way that we accomplish that is really through listening to their stories and being as open and honest about our history as much as we can. And I think that goes a long way. It's also really hard because the communities are very hesitant to let people that aren't a part of their community in because there have been so many instances where it's not worked out real well. So the best thing is to be able to listen and make sure that we're tailoring our messages to their unique needs. I think the stigma around it is that we have so many chronic illnesses and obesity and all of those things. And that's not true, obviously. I mean, any cultural thing that you can think of, like stigma, none of them really apply to the all. But particularly for Native Americans, it's very hard to get past those stigmas of that or, you know, that they're even still here. I I think a lot of people don't realize that there are still very large Native communities throughout the U.S. So a lot of barriers. So as a patient with psoriatic arthritis, I know your personal health journey is a part of your advocacy work. What are some of those key barriers to accessing quality health care for Indigenous people? How have you personally navigated these challenges? And what are some of those insights that you think might be helpful for us to know about? 
Yeah, so those are great questions. So on my personal journey, I live near where my capital is for my tribe. It was not easy, but it was easier to get somewhere that I could get access to healthcare. It was like a 30 minute drive for me to be able to go and access care through the tribe. So I think it's been wonderful. And I personally have had great experiences using the Indian health system. However, I have lots of family that have not had a great outcomes with using it. So I feel like I'm very lucky in that way. I think one of the biggest things has been lack of access to specialties because I would see my PCP, but that was basically it. And so they're not really equipped to deal with all of the specialty things that I need. And so I am lucky enough that I was able to see specialists that are outside of the Indian healthcare system, but so many are not. And they just go to their PCP and have to deal with whatever that outcome is. So there's not really a great answer to that. It's like if you have access to getting care outside, like specialty care outside of the system, fine. And if you don't, you get what you get. And it's regrettable because it's very difficult, especially if you have very specialized needs. And just like with any other healthcare system, they're, you know, running a tight ship too. So if you have special, you know, things and you need to have 30 minute conversation, they're only allotting for you 10, 15 minutes or whatever. And so <laughs> you just, you get what you get and then you wait for your next appointment. And that can be, even just to see a PCP can be months out. So I know that the, each tribe is trying to get better about times and wait times and all of that, but it can still be very long, especially if you need something specialized or a special um, testing or MRIs, that kind of stuff. It can be kind of a wait. Thank you so much for sharing that. I am of a Hispanic culture and background, so I myself have seen how my diversity can be a challenge, you know, when we're dealing with healthcare needs and whether it's language or just the way that our culture can be affected in receiving access. I'm wondering if you can highlight just the importance of cultural sensitivity for your community within healthcare. Like, what are some of the examples of maybe positive experiences that you've had with healthcare providers that have embraced your cultural sensitivity? Great question. And I have been lucky enough that most of my providers have been absolutely amazing about embracing my background, my heritage. I know that it has been at times really hard for other family members. And I think the first thing that I always want to kind of educate about, especially physicians, because we have what we call the Indian healthcare system, but we as a group as a tribe, we do not identify that. So even just the labeling of our race is a big thing and that you do have to kind of educate towards. So many times it's just like, oh, great, you're Indian, mark the box. And it's like, I'm not Indian. I'm not from India. I am native here. I am a Native American. And I know that within the different areas and groups, they all prefer something indigenous or native or whatever. But I, the very first thing that I have to educate providers on is I am Native that's my preferred way to speak of myself. I don't appreciate the term Indian. And even within the healthcare system, even if you're using the Indian healthcare system, they still call you Indian. And I it just makes me cringe every time I hear it. <laughs> so I'm sure that you've also had that in just educating what you are, what your race, what you'd like to be called. So and that was my very first barrier <laughs> and my first education of physicians is just who I am as a group, who I identify as. 
Some struggles that I've had are, I don't know if they necessarily take my race too far into their decision making. Like, I don't know that a lot of times, like things that I would be maybe, you know, like hereditary type situations and they're like, "Mm, nah, I don't think so. I don't think that would be appropriate for you. I don't think that they take those necessarily seriously when I do present them. I know when I started the journey of trying to get diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis, I had told them that my aunt had passed from lupus complications and that my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, he had rheumatoid arthritis. And at the time, my mother did not have rheumatoid. She's since been diagnosed, but she probably had it just undiagnosed for many years. And I remember saying, well, we're at a very high incident as a group, as Native peoples, of having autoimmune. And because of my family history, I feel like we should maybe be testing for some of those autoimmune things. And the first physician that I saw was like, no, I don't think so. I don't think it's that. Let's just see what's going on. You know, I think their first conclusions were always like the simplest, which I'm sure like 90% of the time that's correct. But given my family history and my racial background, like it should have been a no brainer just to start there. But here we are. So it took me from the time that I saw that physician to actually getting diagnosed probably five, six months. So it delayed treatment. Thank you so much, Ashley. I think that it is very important for us to hear those words and always something to keep in mind and learn about when we are dealing with a diverse community and also our own needs within our different cultures as well. So it is very well known that the indigenous community has a rich traditional health and healing practice. How can we bridge that gap between traditional healing methods and modern medical care so that we could provide more comprehensive support to patients while still being respectful of some of their cultural differences? I love this question. So I had worked on a class last year, last fall, anyway, about nutrition and And my focus was on Native American nutrition. So one of the things that I think people don't really understand is that Native Americans were like the first nutritionists. Food is medicine kind of thing. So everything that we have, tomatoes and corn and squashes and all of the things that you would traditionally say are really great for your health. And it wasn't until the removal that we really started seeing a lot of those obesity and diabetes become very prominent because we were not allowed as people to do our traditional farming and gardening and all of those things. So I truly think that the biggest thing is food is medicine and Native Americans were the first. They're inspired by it and no one gives them that credit for all of the things that they used as medicinal. So I think we're actually doing a really good job of bridging the gap there in terms of traditional and non-traditional medical interventions what we currently think of as medical. And so I think we just need to be able to say this was your heritage. You started it and give them credit for it and kind of (laughs) give them credit for it and allow them to have those abilities again to grow their own food and in their tradition and fish and hunt the way that they need to and not pollute our water systems. That would be a huge great start. (laughs) I mean, just bridging that (laughs) would be great. So as a longstanding advocate, what recommendations do you have for, let's say, healthcare providers that are listening to this and when they are working with patients that have specific rheumatic or other health conditions that are chronic illnesses, what are the ways that they can try to address some of the specific needs for the Indigenous community? I think the most important thing will be to be a partner. 
there's a lot of authoritative leadership from physicians in no matter what race that you are, just in general between physician and patient. And I think a lot of times we kind of defer to them because it's not really our area of specialty. And so I think the best thing for physicians to do is to, one, educate themselves about Native American groups and their history and really look back at how things have changed for them in the last 200 years, 150 years, and be sensitive to it and thoughtful and be a partner in that journey and ask thoughtful questions not just go in and say, oh, yeah, your A1C level is high, or you've got diabetes or whatever, and just giving a blanket like, yep, that's your diagnosis. Oh, yeah, you're native and your mom and your dad had it. Okay, great. Yep. And check off the box. I think there needs to be like that conversation about what are you eating? What are you doing during the day? What are some barriers to accessing nutritious food or whatever? Oh, well, you have a family history of it and you have type one. Okay, well, I can't really do anything, you know, for that. You just are. That's a chronic illness at that point. So being a good partner, listening, asking questions, saying when you don't understand goes a long way. And just being patient, that goes across all spectrums, but particularly with the Native communities because they're not eager to discuss things with people that are outside of their group. And I don't blame them (laughs) given everything that we've gone through, especially through the medical field. So I want to take this opportunity to give you a little quiz. Do not get scared. It's pretty easy. (laughs) I would like for you to finish this sentence for me. What I most want for the health and support of my community is. (laughs) What I want most for the health and support of my community is education. Just a mere understanding would go a huge long way. And I think people don't realize that there are still Native Americans living in the U.S. They have this image of teepees and stuff like that. It's like, no, we've evolved. We're still here. We're still trying to, uh, you know, survive. So just educate and be aware. Ashley, I truly appreciate your insight. And I thank you for being a strong and beautiful representation of your community. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to having you back again. Well, thank you so much, Angel, for having me on this podcast and for talking about something that is so important to me, which is my community, Native Americans. And I really want to thank GHLF for all that they're doing. They are so eager to learn and grow and outreach to so many. And I appreciate that so much. I know that when we all collaborate together, our outcomes will be so much better. And I am so grateful to be asked to do this. One, to represent that. And then two, to be able to hopefully reach others and give them a place where they can come and feel included. Thank you for listening to this special episode of Wellness Evolution. We hope this episode sparks a conversation with you and your family about your culture, diversity, and the experiences that unite us. I'm your host, Angel, and I appreciate you joining us on this journey. Remember to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode and help spread the word by rating our podcast, writing a review, and sharing us with your friends and family. The Wellness Evolution Podcast conversation and content are intended for informational and educational purposes only. Any content shared is not intended to substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from a physician or qualified health provider. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.